Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Art Institute. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Irene Sunwoo. I am the John H. Bryan Chair and Curator of Architecture and Design here at the museum. Um, and before we get started, just a little housekeeping. If you could all please take a moment to sil silence your cell phones, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. And with today's program, we are so thrilled to celebrate the exhibition, Jonathan Mickey, Objects in Sculpture. The exhibition is part of the Frankie Harrow Design Series, which highlights emerging talent in design. And I would like to uh, express my sincere and deep gratitude to Jay Frankie and David Harrow for their support of this very important exhibition series, which has allowed the department to realize four amazing exhibitions focused on contemporary design. And today's program is made possible by the Frank J. Mooney Memorial Fund. And before introducing our two wonderful speakers today, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly thank others who have supported Jonathan in the realization of this exhibition. So thank you to Sam Vince and Claire Warner from Volume Gallery, Manira Gallery, Brian Stonehawker, and our phenomenal project team here at the museum which includes Joanna Abajaudi, Mary Coyne, Thomas Houston, Elizabeth Mesher, Lorenzo Conti, Kristen Gillette, Isaac Faccio, Salvador Cruz, Joseph Vitino, Joyce Penn, Patrick Smith, Matthew Alicea, Ryan Pfeiffer, Sheila Madrimdar, Emily Fry, Robin Hoffman, and Hen Henri Aboud, Bob Cisla, and Tom Ryan. It takes a village to make an exhibition, for sure. And I'm so pleased to introduce our two wonderful guests today. Uh, Jonathan Mickey is a designer based in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he's been developing a singular design practice that spans commissioned works, environments, and creative experiments. He studied architecture at Iowa State University and then 3D design at Cranbrook. And his work is in many major institutional collections, including the Art Institute. And we are also so pleased to have Zoe Ryan join us. Uh, Zoe is the Daniel W. Dietrich second director at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania. And she is an absolutely vital part of the design DNA of Chicago. She is my predecessor here at the museum uh, where she established our phenomenal design collection. So thank you, Zoe, for getting that off the ground. I'm so pleased to, to be uh, working on that collection now. Um, and she's also you know, realized landmark exhibitions here at the museum, including In a Cloud, In a Wall, In a Chair, Six Modernists in Mexico at Mid-Century, as well as Making Place, The Architecture of David Adjaye. And Zoe is really responsible for laying the groundwork for Jonathan's show. Um, it was perhaps the last project that she was working on before she left for the ICA. Um, and she was also the one that really steered the Frankie Harrow design series and really made contemporary design a really central part of the discourse here at the museum. So I actually wanted to start with you, Zoe, and ask you to speak a little bit about the series and some of your ambitions and some of the projects uh, that came out of that program. And maybe we can then uh, transition into how you landed on Jonathan as the fourth protagonist in that program. Thanks, and thanks, Irene. Um, it is wonderful to be back. I felt like I left under the cloak of darkness with COVID, so it's nice to finally be able to say hello and, and also uh, see you soon to uh, um, my friends here. I also want to say, Irene, thank you for picking up the mantle of this exhibition. I am absolutely delighted that Irene was selected as uh, my successor. Um, just to know the department is in such good hands is just fantastic. Um, and I really look forward to watching everything that, that you do here. And of course, Jonathan, thank you for being such a fabulous partner and um, yeah, sticking with us as we as this <laughs> exhibition took its time to um, be realised. So um, Jay Frankie is a, a really important collector of design, um, just a huge supporter of designers. And it, the design series, the Frankie Harrow design series, really came about through lots of conversations about the collection here and how we were going to move forward, but also really thinking about how could we show design in, in its absolute diversity. 
So what we're looking at here is an exhibition of the first show, which was with Max Lamb, a British designer um, that Jay and I both knew and had followed his work for a long time. And we felt like he'd be a good place to start, especially with the history of craft practices in in Chicago and in the Midwest. Um, But also looking at someone that was absolutely committed to the kind of materials he worked with and trying to really... Um, excel in a very physical way with these projects. So his his work is always about starting with the material, um, seeing what he can physically do himself to create. These are called exercises in seating. And we were really interested in sort of this as the starting point for, for the series. Um, the next project... Um, was was this one with Christine Meindertsma, which some of you might remember. Uh, Christine is a a Dutch designer, uh, much more interested in a kind of research-based practice. And we already had works from, by Christine in the collection. Some of you might remember the pig book where she created this pig, um, this book which really documented where every part of a pig goes. So of course it's in bacon and pork scratchings, but it's also in bread, in x-ray film, in cigarettes, in all kinds of things. So she's really interested in using her practice to kind of interrogate the industry and big industry. And of course, all of the designers, I think, for the series, what binds them together is a real seriousness and rigor. Um, I was always really, with Christine, I just couldn't believe that she could get behind the scenes of like the lipstick industry or, you know, whatever industry she was trying to figure out how 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 they worked, whether they were sustainable, what the kind of global politics were. So it was a very interesting number two. The third installation actually opened in 2021? 20, we got this. 21, yeah, February. Um, Which was with a Turkish collective called Ambiguous Standards Institute. And they really look at kind of the um, social, political, cultural implications of design. So how, and especially what they called ambiguous standards. So we think we have a lot of standards. Of course, it's a very modernist approach. Standards in how we talk about health or um, time electricity like everything that's around us and obviously you realize that there are so many anomalies that there really aren't that many standards um, and they really interrogate why that is so they they use their exhibition at the art institute to really look at different typologies of objects um, to tell us about the more about the world in which we live and you're seeing some of their fantastic posters on the left of that of that um of the image And Jonathan was someone that Jay and I, we'd been following their work. We saw their work. I think I saw their first one piece. Was it one or a couple of pieces we were talking about earlier at Volume Gallery? We've been big supporters of Jonathan's. Um, I saw his work in um, in the Brussels Gallery, which I always call Maniera, but maybe it's Manira. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, and Jay and I had followed his practice. I did a studio visit, I think, in 2017 with Jonathan. Um, we also collected his work before this, his CS stool, which I think we'll see shortly. Um, as part of the collection. And Jonathan and I just started a kind of a loose conversation about when will be the right time to maybe show a bigger body of work. Um, And I think it was quite a... Yeah, I always... Jonathan's work is beguiling. Um, I think it is can be quite challenging we can talk about you know in what ways but I think also it really forces you to be in a relationship with it to really kind of take into consideration not only the object but yourself your body your um yeah how 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 you think about objects how you relate to them um and I always found that really fascinating in in Jonathan's practice and I thought this would be a great yeah a great addition to the series and finally after many years here here it is so I urge you all if you haven't seen the exhibition um to go upstairs in the the modern wing to see it it's it's really beautiful and maybe we'll just show a few more installation shots in case some of you haven't been up at the gallery yet and I could also ask Jonathan to maybe give a quick snapshot overview for our guest. Sure, sure. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Irene. I'm happy to share this work. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's not very often I talk about my work. Uh, it's um, In a lot of ways, it's a kind of solitary practice. Um, I work in a city which can support me, but uh, it also lets me be free, uh, the Twin Cities. 
So being here talking about the work is a bit strange, but I also believe that it's important and um, saying what I can about what I do um, and being as generous as possible is, is important to me. Um, <clears throat> the show, uh, the idea behind the show, which was developed with you, Zoe, in 2019, uh, we'll look at a booklet, the proposal booklet here in a moment, but the show really was in a way decided then and kind of put and kept and that same idea was then done uh, three years later. Um, here you see objects in the gallery. Uh, these objects uh, don't have typologies. They operate by pushing against the limits of what we know of designed objects. Um, they all do it in a very similar way, but the outcome uh, is different each time. I thought that this would be an interesting way to talk about design, to show design uh, in objects that you wouldn't think of as being uh, designed. Yeah, and in the exhibition, there are eight individual works. Um, and I should also say this is Jonathan's first solo exhibition at a major institution. So I think this was also a wonderful moment to stop and reflect um, on, on your body of work. Um, and just a, a last shot here. Uh, but I did want to pick up on something that you mentioned, which was object limits. And I think, Zoe, when you said that the work is beguiling, this is the perfect word. Uh, it's not like you'll ever get the object uh, on your own. Uh, it, it's really a body of work that really forces you to engage and think with your senses as well as your intellect. Um, and I think at times um, it's confrontational in a way because it, it's not transparent. There's a certain opacity, figuratively speaking, about a lot of these things. Although literally as well, you don't <laughs> deal typically with transparent material, uh, I think, uh, which is maybe something we can return to later in terms of talking about materiality. Um, but I think it's important, this concept of object limits, uh, because this is something consistent throughout all of these works, which when you see them and encounter them, um, are, seem all quite different. But the way that Jonathan speaks about them is that they're doing something that's the same throughout, um, and also the way that you interact with them. Um, and in some of our exchanges, Jonathan had pulled out this quote, which he very graciously allowed me to include here as a slide. Um, this was from his notebooks when he was a student at Cranbrook. I personally wouldn't want to <laughs> share my notes from my student days with anyone, but um, I think he was confident that this was actually consistent with how he's thinking today. So I just wanted to include it here to kind of prompt us to um, talk further about the works in the show. So he wrote, principally, objects present limits, figured in function, process, material, form, idea, and so on. In this case, objects are measured to each variable and equally fixed in these variables. In this normal and productive way, objects are figured backwards. My interest is going forward, remaining inconclusive to the terms of measurement. So that's not the easiest passage to, to engage with, but Jonathan, maybe you can speak a little bit further uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into some of your ideas. Well, I remember, I remember writing this. Um, one, I had read um, a very similar statement made by George Brecht uh, talking about uh, the limits, finding the limits. He was calling this an exercise. And I, I like this very much uh, at Cranbrook, um, which is a, a school where you work alongside your peers. It's all a peer review. And I, I was becoming very disinterested in what was going on, um, partially because it was so easy to criticize everything that was being produced or affirm everything that was being produced. Uh, there was no um, r rigor, in my opinion. To, to a lot of what was happening at Cranbrook and I thought also when what I was learning about the design. I was coming to Cranbrook uh, from an architecture office, from being educated as an architect. And I, I just had different expectations somehow about what should happen and what should be 
something should be pushed. There should be a limit to, to what's happening. There should be some uh, objective way of measuring what's happening. And there should, should be some criticality into what was happening. And so I went about uh, working this way and I wrote this statement. And at the top of the statement, I wrote terms of my practice, uh, which in, in effect was like a mission statement. <laughs> a way of, uh, of you know, coming back to it and reading it and thinking about what was there and, and what I could do with it. Um, you know, it, it's something that's still alive uh, in what I do now. In fact, I don't think really anything's changed. Uh, I, I, um, I kind of enjoy this about what I do, that, that things remain the same, that ideas are constant, that the process is constant that there, there is a, a kind of predictable way and productive way that, that I, that I uh, practice. Um, and so, um, I think that it's true in the objects that I'm showing in the gallery, but it's also true in a kind of another type of object that I work on, which would be a chair or a table. Um, you know, typologies are important. You know, functional items are a necessity. Um, they are in some ways harder to do than what I uh, have done with the objects in the gallery. But I think that this type of statement, while it seems uh, kind of intense, is applicable to, to objects that have typologies. It's a kind of a practice that's um, kind of... there. Uh, it's a statement that, that is capable of being interpreted in different ways. Yeah. And the consistency is remarkable in terms of what you say uh, and the through line in your practice. And I think a good case in point, uh, and this is where I'll lob it over to Zoe to talk about how the exhibition came together because um, when I came into this position and I first uh, talk to Jonathan, you know, he had the same idea. He didn't want to change anything, even though I think about two years had passed, maybe since it was supposed, or, you know, since it had originally been slotted into the schedule. Um, a lot of times artists come up with new ideas, want to change things last minute, but he had the same uh, exact list of objects and also a layout for the room. Um, so maybe you and Zoe can talk about the early conversations and we can flip through this original concept proposal that you sent to her. Yeah, so this was a, a booklet that I had made and sent to Zoe or we met and we reviewed it together, I can't remember. Um, but a booklet for me is a regular way of communicating. Um, normally they are staple bound, uh, folded in half, uh, eight and a half by 11. This is what it is. Um, a booklet for me is a, an entire idea. So there's a lot of thought given to how things appear, how the cover is related to the back, how it could go this way or that way, how you can get to the back and then flip it over and move backwards through the book. So ideas take take form and, and booklets for, for me, particularly when it's something that needs to be shared. Uh, so I had sent this to you, um, or did we meet and review it? I, I can't remember. I think we did a bit of both. Did we? Maybe you sent it and then we met. Yeah, so I hadn't looked at this booklet in a long time, uh, but in preparation for this talk, I found the, the original booklet where I had written notes to myself uh, about uh, what I would say to Zoe. Uh, and looking b uh, backwards, it is remarkable to me how consistent things re remain. <laughs> um, there is the gallery. Is it 283? Mm -hmm. um, which is a, a generous gallery. There is daylight coming uh, on one side. Uh, it's quite big. It's tall. It's a square. Um, and I thought, well, uh, the center of the gallery needs to be removed. Uh, if there is to be eight objects in the gallery, and each object should occupy the gallery in the same way, that there couldn't be a center to the gallery. 
Did I talk about this in the same way? Do you remember? Yeah, no, you did. <laughs> you did. Same. I mean, you're very intentional. Yeah. You know, in everything you do. And it, the, you said something really funny the other day where you were like, there is no unstructured play in my work. And I thought <laughs> this was... But there is... Why I'm smiling so much is because I, I do remember this booklet, but I remember a different booklet too, which he has got here, which um, is literally... Exactly. That's exactly what I did when I was when I, when these booklets kept showing up, because Jonathan gives you absolutely nothing but everything all at the same time, <laughs> and I think that's what happened. And then, of course, he comes with a. I mean, this is so unusual when you're doing an exhibition that a designer will come with a fully fledged proposal. Here's my booklet. This is the show I want to do, and it's not that there's no conversation because we had tons of conversation about what the what the show would be, the pieces that you selected. But I think if if Irene moves on, I mean, you'll start to see that. Yeah, the pieces are the pieces he selected. And I think it was because we had waited, we'd had a lot of conversations, and by then you had this big enough body of work. Um, and I think, yeah, we can talk about the big cylinder in the middle. I just found that such a... I mean, Jonathan knows that I, I think of the... Um, these black circles and that bla that cylinder as like his Malevich moments, you know, the, the black square. It's like something that you're working against. And I was reading about it recently because it's not, obviously it's not the same, but the thing that I love about um, that painting, Malevich is, you know, it's a painting with a, a white background and the black square and he hung it very high on a wall um, as if it was a religious painting. But the the painting started as a curtain for an opera where Malevich had designed this, this curtain with these black squares. And of course he was a designer and a painter and was kind of crossing disciplines as you do. But it was the first, it's known as the first piece that was a piece of abstract art. So it didn't, it doesn't represent anything. Um, and what I, what I always think about though, is it's like counter, you always refer back to that. Anything that is shown with that is in relief. And I feel the same about the cylinder or the black dots. I mean, all your works kind of have to either work against or in association with that cylinder. It's kind of there, but it's not there in, in the galleries. Um, and I, I, I think immediately I found the, even though the concept was so beguiling, I, I, could, I could imagine it. And I thought, yeah, this is, this is a brilliant way to approach this, this gallery because we're always trying to do something different in there. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the cylinder was, um, I mean, in, in kind of, in different terms, it was a, like, a, and rather than each object having a pedestal, it was taking all of the pedestals that the objects would normally have and putting them all together into one thing uh, in the middle of the room. But the, it still operates in a very decisive way. Um, it makes the objects interact with one another via the cylinder. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I just find it so striking that this is the first image that's presented. It's not a list of the works, which are also included in this booklet, but you're really thinking about the space of the gallery, which I'd like to think comes from your architecture background as well. And I think it's a specific strategy to an exhibition. And I know that you're, you have a, a critical perspective on design exhibitions and oftentimes when we've spoken about the show, you've talked about what can a design exhibition be? So could you talk a little bit about the exhibition as a project rather than as a platform for work? Uh, well, in my, I mean, in this case, the, the exhibition had to, to deal with the space that was given in a way. It wasn't putting things on display. It was somehow incorporating the space uh, into the exhibition that the two can't really be separate. Um, that the, the gallery represents uh, a given space and the exhibition needs, needs to understand that space and, and find a way to, to, to use it. And now I'm remembering that you told me your original idea was to do the opposite of this, right? To have a cylindrical void in the center and block off uh, the surrounding walls, but that was not up to code <laughs> with fire <laughs> safety. <laughs> uh, but this, I think, is a, a much more elegant solution. <laughs> yeah, so the cylinder 
in terms of, well, it takes away the center of the gallery. The cylinder is more or less 10% of the gallery, uh, if you calculate um, the floor area. Um, so there's still a lot of space that remains for, for objects. Um, the cylinder had to be of a particular height and a particular width, uh, meaning that the, the cylinder off also offers a scale uh, to the gallery that the gallery lacks. Um, so here the, the cylinder is 80 inches tall, which means that it's just beyond you. Uh, and the width of the cylinder is 16 feet, uh, which means that you don't uh, th think of it like a column. Uh, you are much more um, comfortable being beside it because you don't think of it as a, as a circular element when you're near it. Um, but most it's kind of there and not there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, that's when I think of, you know, the square painting. Um, I, I think that some ideas, and the reason ideas don't need to change, that some ideas are capable of absorbing other ideas, that they can be flexible enough to to work uh, in per perpetuity. That there, uh, an idea doesn't have to be a precise thing. An idea can be a kind of soft thing. It can be an unknown thing that you can push for uh, things that you um, may not understand fully even. And so this exhibition, I think, based on the objects that are included and on the design of the exhibition, uh, kind of acknowledge that in a way. Maybe Zoe and Jonathan, can you talk a little bit about the actual checklist and the selection of objects which span from your student days actually to the present? Um, the latest object is from 2021. Um, so these are included in the booklet as well. And Jonathan's signature white background uh, setup. Yeah, so here you see um, photographs of the objects, but the, uh, the background is removed. Um, these images are from the archive that I keep of my projects, which uh, is m one image per object, and they're kept like this. Um, here in the booklet, you can see that the, the bleed through of the previous object uh, is behind the object that you are seeing on the page. Uh, it's important here that the objects retain a relative scale um, so that, that you can understand them as a group rather than understanding them as specific individual objects. Uh, the first work, as Irene alluded to, well, the two works, the earliest works are student work. Um, the, I think made in the second year at Cranbrook. The box there. And then the next one, the wooden scrambler. Um, Cranbrook was a time for me to do as much as I could. It was, I th uh, as that statement kind of alluded to, the beginning of my practice. So I didn't think of myself as a student, per se. I thought of myself as a kind of um, professional. Uh, <laughs> You know, I went to work every day. I would be there at eight in the morning and leave at five in the evening. Um, and I would try to make a new project on a, on a regular basis, four weeks, six weeks. Uh, and, and there was a real haste to what I was doing. So box and scrambler, particularly scrambler, if you see it, you can, you realize that there was some uh, haste involved. There was some, um, ambition to do as much and to understand as much as possible. Uh, and I thought it would be, it's important to show uh, these early works alongside newer work. When you, when you say to do as much as possible, you mean testing the material or tell us a bit about that process? Yeah, so, you know, material is one part of each object. But when I think of an object, I also think of all the other parts of the object which would be things like scale or proportion, idea, color, um, texture. You know, the, the, in a way, the, the things, the characteristics that everything has, um, every object has, uh, but putting them together in a way where um, you can't separate them any longer. Mm -hmm. 
it seems uh, as if everything's put together in a way where it's inseparable or it's indivisible. Uh, and so Cranbrook for me was that. It was making objects um, that could do that in as many different ways as possible. Jonathan, the way that you describe your student experience, this professionalism, <laughs> where do you think that sense of discipline comes from? Because I know what I was like when I was in that age, and I don't necessarily recall going into school from eight to five and having a set agenda and a plan. Yeah, you know, it could be part of the way that I was raised. Uh, it could be that um, I was coming to an art school from an architecture practice, working in an office. Um, it could also be, I think, partially uh, my architectural education. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it maybe has more to do with the way that I was raised and the, the person that I am, just uh, inherently, I suppose. <laughs> one of the, th well, I remember one of the conversations we had was that we, each piece we wanted to be quite distinct, either the materiality or its function, because I do think these works have have function. Um, but it, it, there was also something, I was reading the labels, I, I went through the Cezanne exhibition here the, uh, yesterday, and there was the way that Gloria Groom, who's the curator there, she wrote something on the wall, and I'm going to compare you to Cezanne now, so take this as a compliment, um, but she wrote, um, Cezanne's paintings ask viewers to hold two competing ideas in their minds, that of the thing represented and that of the medium constructing it. And it just struck me so much about your work. I mean, maybe there's more than two, two things that you're... But I'm always so conscious of trying to figure out what is this thing. And then I'm very conscious that it's made a very specific way. And I wonder... And you, you do have quite a specific approach. I mean, I think um, we were having a tour earlier on with a couple of designers. And I think it's the way that the, the show makes everything look singular as if you just made that one thing. But obviously some of these works, they're very deceptive in their simplicity. I mean, they, some of them you've, you've worked over like decades with trying to kind of perfect the, the material or the way that you're working with that material. I wonder if you could tell us more about, yeah, that, that sort of tug between those two seemingly conflicting but very united aspects of your work. Yeah, I mean, in your mind, does this have something to do with process, or how, how, would, how do you...? I guess it has, I mean, to you maybe. I think to the, to the viewer, it's, it's how you... Your work is a lot about perception and how you're perceiving the works in a space, which is where the cylinder comes in, right? I mean, it's... Yeah. You're, you're forcing that, you know, us to, to view it vis-a-vis -vis other things. And there's a lot of, you know, surprisingly in the cube gallery, there's a lot of noise because of the windows and you're looking out over the um, Griffin Court and then across. I mean, and, and this kind of calms the space in a way, having this big cylinder. I mean, it gives you focus references. Um, but yeah, maybe, I mean, I think it would be interesting for people to hear how you work because although some of the processes are fast, like a sketch, everything is considered. Yeah, I can speak uh, to, the, to that a little bit. I mean, it's, um, it's different object by object, of course. Um, some things um, require very little testing. Uh, some things require a kind of enormous amount of testing. Um, but it's always guided by an expectation. So uh, there is always, for me, some sense of what I want. Um, it's not always clear, perfectly clear, but there is some general sense of what I think is possible in a material. Um, Maybe could we use this as an example to, to talk through? Yeah, sure, we can do this. So this is uh, the latest work in the gallery. This is called Rock with Holes. I'm not sure if the, uh, the hole is visible. Yeah, you can see it on the... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So this was a new material for me. I, I, in fact, I know very little about stone. Um, I know what I know about stone is what we all kind of know about stone. 
which is that it's uh, very old and it's permanent, it's very durable. Um, and I also know that uh, humanity has often sculpted stone in different ways uh, to reflect human figures, to mark specific things, uh, to build buildings. Uh, I liked stone not so much for what it had been made into, but for what, what it in, in a way actually is, uh, which is a kind of shape um, and a material. I was interested in changing the stone uh, to, to kind of reimagine the stone, but in, in a way where the shape remained the same. So shape, as I said, is one characteristic of an object. Uh, in this case, it was a constant, so the shape didn't change. I, I was uh, interested in the stone as a kind of... Um, um, in, in its whole, as if it were something complete. Uh, so I, I thought uh, my ambition here, my expectation was to find a way to do this. That became, after testing and doing this on a small piece of stone, applying a um, series of small holes to the stone on a regular grid, not perfectly regular, but close. Um, and the presence of these small holes in the stone by removing small uh, amounts of stone changed, for me, the entire uh, stone. It somehow became more of a stone than it was to begin with. <laughs> um, and I like very much you know, this kind of consideration. So a lot of my process is uh, simply a consideration. Uh, thinking something for a long time, thinking of a revised version of that thought for a long time, and this begins and it lasts for a long time. This object is actually a bit of an outlier in the checklist um, in that it is a found object that you've engaged with in some way with this concept of limits and some kind of, let's say, formal challenge to yourself. And I, I think in that sense, it's actually a very good example of what your practice is in this particular strand about exploration of the limits of formal material um, volume, like all, all of these qualities of the physical world. Um, so this is a pretty illuminating example to me. Um, but maybe we can also talk about how you construct certain examples with these formal challenges in your mind, which have to do with perception. And you often say all of these objects are conceived of and whatever they're doing, performing, challenging with a human in mind. So maybe you could talk about the human as well in relation to these objects and tell us a little bit about this particular example. Yeah, sure. I think that's, that's very important to talk about. Uh, and that was also uh, something that was thought about in the very beginning. And that was that these, all, these objects share a kind of one-to-one -one scale with a human. They are um, a kind of equal or an opposite to a human. Um, they push much like a chair supports a human, you know, and that scale of the human is imprinted into the chair. These also are imprinted with the scale of a human uh, because the human is beside them or, or looking at them um, or moving around them. Um, you know, I think that th that, in a sense, is a kind of expanded idea of design. That des design can can really be talked about as uh, uh, something that is human, uh, that makes uh, that makes it design. That that it is a reflection of a human being. So these things in the gallery all share, I thought, a particular scale. That it was really clear that the human was uh, in these objects. Uh, but not always in the same way, whether it be the stabilizer here, which is a, a carbon fiber lozenge shape on four legs. Um, it was meant to introduce this idea of a horizontal. How do you capture a kind of interior horizon in an object? Something that a human 
it, well, it's almost kind of a necessity f for a human to be able to see the horizon, to understand uh, its place relative to the horizon, a kind of stabilizer. Uh, so, so this object was thought to, to do that. How can that be done? How can uh, that humanity be in an object uh, in those terms? A kind of abstract terms. So this meant for me that the, the object operates on a kind of horizontal axis, that there is a, a, a dominant equator, but that the shape is confused, and that you don't understand it as an object by looking at it and saying it is this shape. You understand it by looking at it uh, and feeling stabilized. Uh, I think that's partially due because you don't immediately understand its shape. Um, so, you know, the material is one thing, the height is one thing, the proportions are one thing, uh, its shifted shape is one thing, you know, then there was also in this particular case a highly specialized paint that was applied, uh, which absorbs light, which further masks um, the shape. So here I've often been told that they think, you know, a lot of people read this image as like a table. But in, in fact, it's, it's not, it's a, there are no flat surfaces on it. I've been, you're, Jonathan, there's really no way, no right way to look at any of your, your work, um, which I love about it. But I also think, I mean, when you see a piece like this, I think going back to the earlier point about the, the rock being the found object, some of your work looks like it could potentially be found objects you know, that you could have found that somewhere, you know? But then obviously when you go up close to it, you realize, no, that's just highly, highly crafted. But you often say something that I find so intriguing that you try to diminish the object as much as possible in, in your work. And I wonder, I'm always wondering what you mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you like to deflect, so yeah, I'm well, sure there's going to be some beguiling answer, but yeah, maybe well, you can help us a bit. Sure, here. sure. Well, I don't, I've never, you know, I don't collect objects. I don't really like objects. Like I'm not <laughs> right. a, but you love like making it, like objects. It I, I don't, yeah, I do, but I don't, I don't look at an object and think, like, that's a great object. Um, uh, not even your own objects? <laughs> Not even my own objects. Uh, so when I think of an object, I, I, I want to somehow work behind the object and then uh, immediately take 10 steps back and think about the object's effect on the space nearby it. Uh, and so when I say I try to diminish the object, I think that's, that's a, a reference to the way that, that I think about them is that if I can diminish this to a point then I can get access to what's mm. on the inside of the object and I can have access to what's beyond the object all at the same time instead of just thinking about the object uh, that's in front of me. So it, it's, it's, it's a way of creating space for me to operate. It's a kind of uh, thought. Stripping things of all sentimentality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and cultural references as well. well yeah, but right? then the titles are so interesting in that regard because they are, for me, they, they, what's this one called? The Vertical Expander, and one's called The Shield, and one's called um, The Scrambler. I mean, they are very mm, expressive, might not be the right term, but they are telling you something. They're much more narrative-driven than you you know the work is in essence i mean you don't you don't tell us i mean the 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 curious thing about your work as a curator is obviously we're storytellers we're trying to tell stories through through objects or drawings or um and for me i think the q a that you did with that you worked on with irene is is genius in that regard because it does really help you even though the the they can be quite oblique um, they do get you thinking, but for me, the titles are actually very important because they tell you they they your mind starts to work in a different way. Yeah. What does what is a vertical expander, mm. you know? And and there is some. I do think your work is generous in that regard. Would you tell us a little bit more about the titles? 
Yeah, you know, the titles were a way, they don't always operate in the same way, but a, a title is a way of giving access to the object in a way. I think what's nice about the Q&A here is that, that you, can re you recognize that you can have access to the object in any way you want, that you can mm -hmm. read the object as you want, um, as long as you, you know, consider the object. I, I think it takes some motivation, you know, some curiosity, um, but it's there and I'm not there. You know, you don't need to know what I thought. You can think about the object in your own, in your own terms. But we all do want to know what you've thought <laughs> in making these things. And with that, I, I would be happy to open it up to Q&A if anyone has any questions for Jonathan. Don't be shy, there's microphone stands in the aisle. Um, but I can also just give a little context too about the Q&A. Um, as a curator, this was an interesting discussion because Jonathan didn't want to burden the objects with himself, as he just said. Um, so we didn't want to go the traditional route and provide object labels that said, Jonathan made this in 2009 when he was a graduate student at Cranbrook. Um, and what we did was have a number of conversations that I had transcribed uh, because I'm a terrible note taker. <laughs> so it, it was great to have this transcript where I can cut and paste um, things that he has actually said. So his voice is very literally in there, in both the answers and the questions. And yeah, we did feel like, you know, I'm, uh, aesthetically, I, I don't like to have labels at all. I prefer to have some kind of handout or some auxiliary uh, piece of content that someone can access or they don't need to access it. And in the presentation within the gallery too, Jonathan was adamant about keeping the walls clean, right? All the content lives on the horizontal plane on the floor. Um, so we thought with these Q&As that live kind of outside of the actual gallery space, it was an opportunity to provide some points of access. And I really love the way, too, that these, the way that we've written them, which is quite oblique and that's deliberate, is that sometimes you don't know who's speaking. Maybe it's the object that's speaking. Maybe it's the object that's asking a question about something else as well. And I think this is also um, a point uh, the dialogue between the objects. Can you talk a little bit about how you feel about having all of these things together and the relationships between them? Because they've never been presented all together at once. Yeah, that's right. So no two objects have, have been shown together. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the objects are related to one another by the cylinder. The cylinder acts as a kind of intermediary. So that you would go from object to cylinder to object to cylinder to object. Um, of course, the objects are placed nearby one another. Um, there was some consideration about what object belongs where, but it wasn't um, it wasn't that difficult, really. Uh, it was basically a, a kind of exercise in proximity that uh, one couldn't be too close or too far, that they are like a constellation uh, or planets orbiting the sun in a way where they take a kind of natural position. Um, there was some work done to figure out exact positioning, but um, it seemed, they, they seem to have their natural, their natural place. Um, <clears throat> and it's also, it's true that I've not shown work uh, that's this similar work by work together all at once. Normally you would see one or two of these objects mixed with uh, objects of a regular typology. Uh, I like very much that these are all together all at the same time. I think that that reinforces the fact that, um, <clears throat> in a sense, these are all the same thing. Uh, that you, what you see in one, you can see in another. There is no exception. They are all uh, the same. Which is a challenging <laughs> concept for, for all of us. And I think also you know, speaks to, again, how 
actually how difficult it is to access some of the work via photographs and images. Um, mm -hmm. It really is about the physical presence, um, this kind of atmosphere between things and understanding your physical place uh, in relation to something else. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, we are much larger than our bodies tell us we are, and objects are also much larger than you think they are. And it's this kind of extended version or outward version of an object or ourselves that can interact. I think that was, in, in a way, the way the objects were placed in the gallery was under those considerations. I think it's the, the show for me is interesting now seeing it for real, in that each one looks like an experiment. An experiment in form or, or shape or, or color or material, but also they all feel like prototypes. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's the singularity of each one, you know. And I'd, so people have a, a sense of your work, like the breadth of your work. I mean, I don't know if any of these were commissions, but you are sometimes working to commission and you sometimes do create chairs, you know, or furniture for, for people's people to use. And I wondered, yeah, what, do you have a different approach based on the different types of projects you're working on? Or is that all one and the same? Well, it's one, in, it's one in the same. At least I try to make it all the same. I, you know, I don't think it's uh, something that, I don't think I can change from one day to the next, from one project mm -hmm. to the next. You know, I think I would get lost trying to um, change the kind of mission statement, depending on what day of the week mm -hmm. it is. You also have your limits, <laughs> how many <laughs> objects you can do at once. We have one uh, question in the audience. Yes, thank you for your thoughts about objects and their relativity to space. Um, I was wondering when you put this together and when you think about this, um, what you thought about shadows and lighting the objects for the exhibit. Yeah, you know, that was thought about quite a, quite a lot. Um, we had a discussion one day in the gallery where we said that uh, there could be no shadows on the ground. And so we worked extensively to find a way to do that so that the objects wouldn't appear to be washed in uh, a specific light, but they would receive light in kind of a generalized way. Um, why was that important? Uh, well, because then all the objects appear the same way. Some, somehow the shadow uh, isn't stronger on one object or another. Um, it also seems like it would change the object in a way because you have this extra shadow associated with it. So, anyway. Yeah, correct. So by not having a shadow, you have a kind of even light field. You have a kind of flattening of space. Right, right. And these so objects contained. work against that. Right. So by removing the shadow, uh, the objects are, I think, better able to, to present themselves. Thank you. Well, I think we have a question over here. Yeah, th thank you all for such a wonderful uh, exhibition and, and talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Jonathan, you, 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 know, you touched on a lot of different facets of your, your process and you know, all these different considerations, whether they're aesthetic or conceptual and uh, even functional and, and, and spatial. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious if you have like a particular, uh, if you encounter a particular blind spot or challenge in creating this gestalt or symbiosis, if you will, of, uh, you know, of your work and all the potential relationships. Um, so was the question, it, do I have a challenge? Am I it, challenged it, it, or what's the hard, hardest thing? I, yeah, just, I, I guess, you know, in, in hearing your talk, I, I was just curious what, um, like, what is most important to you when it comes to process or um, the, uh, the integration of architecture and, and design? Like, it, like if, I, I guess, what, what, what is the hardest part for you? Is my question. I think everybody thinks that this is a piece of cake. Because <laughs> he had this question earlier from a designer that was very, I wouldn't say, I will say no names, um, but um, 
as if you I think they're so deceptively simple sometimes that it's you know I'm not I don't want to put words into your into your mouth but I think it's yeah some of them really aren't I mean they're testing gravity they're you're testing materials yeah There's yeah I think, I think that I think that is the hardest part is to work work at something and all uh, and never let it fall apart somehow you always have to keep it uh, together and that in, that in, it means that you are always considering everything all at the same time. That if uh, something changes uh, scale, then everything else has to change. It's this, if, some, if the material isn't capable of doing what I thought it's doing, then everything changes. Because if that one thing can't be the way that I thought it would be, then nothing can be the way that I thought it would be. Uh, it's this kind of insistence that you have an object that's a hole in the end that it's uh, indivisible. And uh, in fact, sometimes I don't think I get it quite right, but that's always the ambition. And I think that takes the most amount of energy. I think that takes the most amount of uh, uh, consideration. And the most amount, it also uh, takes the most amount of doubt. I mean, there is a kind of struggle always uh, to, to find how to make that possible across uh, materials, across scales, across uh, ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. actually a really lovely closing note. Uh, oh, four more questions. Question. Question. Yeah. Um, hi, all. Thanks for being here today. Um, Jonathan, I'm curious if you've dreamed about or if you have placed these objects outside of the institution, outside of the gallery. What does that look like for you? Um, I imagine the vertical expansion living in like a garden in a green space. Like what, what's like the beyond these like white gallery spaces for you at the moment? Yeah, I mean, that, that's interesting. Uh, it reminds me immediately of a conversation that was being had at Cranbrook. And that was um, this idea of somehow you knew where an object belonged based on looking at it. So you could say that this belongs outside or this is inside or this belongs in the living room or this belongs uh, wherever you want, you know. There was a kind of uh, always this question and I didn't like that question at all. <laughs> I didn't like that you, know, you knew somehow where an object belonged based by, by looking at it. Uh, so I thought, well, could it be that uh, this object can belong anywhere? that you, you, aren't, uh, you aren't measuring that object by its environment, per se. Um, so, yeah, it's not something I think about. I mean, I, I think, I, well, I think about it in the way that I just said, is that objects, my general view is that objects can go anywhere. And that's, in a way, a test to know if I've been successful in the object that I've wanted to make is, can it be anywhere? So, you know, a number of these objects are, that are on loan to the museum are coming from a living room. Um, you know, they have, I think, that possibility because they're, they are a reflection of a human and humans are everywhere. Uh, they aren't linked to a specific environment. And I think the word possibility is so key, and you use it quite often when talking about the objects and also potential. So even though there's incredible rigor and precision in all of these things and intense intentionality, the end result is actually an ethos of openness and an invitation to all of us to, to engage and imagine our, reimagine ourselves essentially through our relationship with objects. So with that, I, I'd love to say thank you, Jonathan, so much for organizing this fantastic show, which has been so thought provoking for me as a curator, also for our team, for our conversations with Zoe, and I hope for all of you, I encourage you to go up to gallery 283 to see the show. And I'd again like, love to thank Zoe for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to have her back in the fold with A&D. So thank you all for joining us as well. <laughs>